Today in Applied Science, we're going to talk about mass spectrometers. I'm going to show you how I built this copper tube mass spectrometer, and then we're going to use it to verify the contents of this dietary salt substitute. So this project gets its start in one of my favorite places, the YouTube comments section. No, really, actually, uh, it's your comments that keep me going, and in this case was the inspiration for this whole video. Uh, as it turns out, in 1970, Scientific American published a paper, published an article describing how to build your own mass spectrometer, which itself was based on an academic paper that came out in 1963. So I've gone through quite a bit of development to do this, and it turned out to be quite a detective story. Uh, I've worked on this thing for months, and I went through a period where I thought there's no way it could work the way that the Scientific American article said it would, and I thought they basically fudged the results. And then I flipped back the other way and I said, no, it was probably my fault all along. But as it turns out, the truth is actually somewhere in between. So this actually turned out to be quite an interesting story. Let's talk about how this thing works. The whole business basically happens between here and here. And we load our sample to be analyzed on this side and send it out into a beam where it gets bent back around and comes up this side and is detected over here. And there's a really good analogy for how this works, right? Like if we take white light and send it through a prism, we get a spectrum of colors and we can measure the amount of each color that make up that white light. And in this case, what we're doing is taking our sample and sending it in a beam this way and we spread it out into its component masses. So remember that everything is made up of the chemical elements and each one of them has its own mass. So the idea with a mass spectrometer is to basically break that matter up into its atoms and just weigh how much we have of each, right? This is a really powerful concept because it gives us the ability to say what any chemical is. So for example, if we put some of this in here, uh, the chemical formula for this is C6H5N3. And if we put this through the mass spectrometer, it would tell us that we have ratios of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen with a few other assumptions. And then we would know, oh, if we ever see those, that ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, we know it's benzotriazole. Boom, there you go. So it's a way to give us an instant readout of what a chemical is just based on having access to a little bit of that chemical and, and no other information. But you can see there's a pretty big problem here, right? If we take another chemical uh, that has a similar formula, this one is C10H8N2, you'd say, okay, we know that ratio, we could identify this. But what if we had a mixture of both of these? Now we've got a problem because all the carbons mix together with all the hydrogens and all the nitrogens, and we would have some new ratio, but the mixture would determine what that ratio is, but we don't know what the mixture is because that's what we're trying to analyze. And this is actually a real problem with mass spectrometers that break everything up into the constituent atoms. We just have no way of knowing what the mixture originally was. And for this reason, most mass spectrometers in industry are uh, preceded by a chromatograph. And so a chromatograph separates molecules based on their size, and then the output of that gets put into the mass spectrometer to analyze the atoms within each molecule. So it's almost like a hierarchical way of uh, separating things into components and then analyzing each component. So we're going to skip the chromatograph for today, but if someone sees a Scientific American article about building one in a home shop, uh, be sure and let me know in the comments and we'll make a future video about it. Uh, but we'll get around the problem of having this sort of mixture ambiguity by only putting pure substances in here. So if we can guarantee that we're only analyzing a pure substance, then we, we don't have this problem with ambiguity. So I keep talking about adding a sample to this thing. So let's open it up and see what that actually entails. Um, I've got a little grounding strap here. This is conductive copper tape, and I've got a little lead here so I can quickly disconnect this and then open this up. And the way it's built is basically taking a rubber stopper and loading up some needles, some long sewing needles into a drill press and then shoving them through the stopper and then soldering some bits to this uh, end of the needle. So basically we get a, a pass-through. It's really the cheapest, easiest way to make a vacuum pass-through. And at first you might be thinking, well, this is terrible for vacuum because the rubber is not going to be compatible with this high-end vacuum system. Well, first of all, this is not a high-end vacuum system. And second, you might be surprised, actually, the record, even with all this rubber exposed on the inside of my vacuum system, we can still get this down to really good vacuum levels. And that ended up not being a problem, thankfully.
Quick note about the vacuum system. You need really good vacuum when you're doing mass spectrometry because the ions are moving relatively slowly through here. So there's a lot of time for them to be interfered with by you know, gas molecules that you don't want in there. Ideally, you want literally nothing between the collector and the emitter, but uh, nothing is an impossibility. So we try to do the best we can. So this is just a penning gauge, a vacuum gauge to see how good the vacuum is in there. And this is a turbo molecular pump uh, which is really convenient for this because we have to start it up and shut it down very frequently. And it, this is a, one of the fastest start and stop you know, vacuum pumps you can get, and it's also very clean. Um, so the basic idea is just put everything together, uh, turn on the roughing pump on the floor there, and then turn on the turbo molecular pump, and the whole thing gets down to vacuum in about 10 or 15 minutes. And when I say down to vacuum, this thing will typically achieve five times 10 to the minus four tor, which is pretty good considering there's rubber stoppers and everything in there. Um, everyone is concerned about leaded, you know, solder copper problems and everything, but we're way beyond that. Like we're, if we have large rubber stoppers exposed, that's gonna be a much bigger issue than leaded copper uh, or leaded solder and everything. Uh, I made this copper tube contraption on the lathe and originally just used rubber tube fittings to connect the thing to the vacu various vacuum pumps, like uh, little bits of rubber tubing like this. This was a super big mistake. So this, this PVC tubing outgasses like a beast. In fact, I, I almost didn't believe how bad it was. Like even using a little section like this, just you know, a couple centimeters exposed in there, totally unacceptable, it ruins the vacuum. I don't know why those black stoppers are okay and this isn't, but it, it isn't okay. And then I, used this you know, professional rubber vacuum hose, and this was also pretty bad. Again, I don't know why this is so much worse than those rubber black rubber stoppers, but it, it was. It might've just been the fact that using a hose clamp with these vacuums is just a really bad idea. But again, I'm using black rubber stoppers here and it's fine. So anyway, I ended up uh, brazing on some um, custom KF fittings on the ends of this copper tube. And uh, that's how I put everything together. I was originally going to use this huge glass oil diffusion pump for this project, but the problem is the startup and shutdown time on this thing is just so long, like over half an hour for both ways or even, you know, even more. Uh, it was really killing my productivity. So I'll probably come back to this in the future because it is a pretty cool device and uh, it does work pretty well. It's just slow to start up and shut down. I've got a little tabletop gas burner as its power source. Um, so let's zoom in and see how this uh, source, ion source, works. So here's the business end of this ion source, and the real key component is that tungsten filament. It's basically a light bulb filament um, that have been extracted from tiny tungsten filament light bulbs. I've actually become a super expert in crushing light bulbs and extracting the filament carefully so that the glass bead and the filament are still intact. And the way that we add a sample to this thing is put a drop of water that contains our sample dissolved in it right on the filament and let it dry either by passing a current through the filament or just blowing some hot air on it or just waiting around. And eventually what we'll have is a filament that is coated with the powder basically. It's just a way of getting the powder onto the filament. And then we put this thing together into the mass spectrometer and turn it on and heat it up. And when the filament gets to, you know, red heat, it will actually ionize the sample for us. It's actually a process that happens all by itself. Like you've heard of uh, tungsten filaments boiling off electrons when it gets hot. Uh, it can also produce ions. The electrons smash into uh, all those atoms and molecules that are sitting on the surface and it ionizes some of them. And the trick is that all of these things are electrically isolated from each other in here. So the filament is held at a positive voltage relative to the metal of this case. So as soon as an ion is formed in there, it gets zipped out of this whole assembly because there's a strong electric field that's trying to push it out. But as you can see, there's a slit at the top, very narrow, it's really only about uh, three or four thou thick, about the thickness of a razor blade. And in fact, this is formed from razor blades. So basically the way that I made this was to put razor blades between these two washers and solder everything together so that the solder holds everything in place. Keep in mind throughout this video, I'm gonna make a lot of generalizations. So when I say things like spectrometers generally work with positive ions, not negative ions, there's plenty of counterexamples. 
Um, and mass spectrometers don't always break things down into component atoms. A lot of times there's molecular fragments left and so on. Um, mass spectrometry is a huge field with tons and tons of different stuff going on. And in a future video, I'm going to talk about a more modern technique uh, that uses lasers to do the ionization, and then things really get interesting. Uh, but anyway, back to this ion gun. Uh, so the filament is at a positive voltage, we're producing positive ions, the slit is at a negative potential, or it's ground basically. So as soon as an ion gets formed from that point on the filament, it goes flinging out through the slit because uh, there's this electric field accelerating it. And it's helpful to think about this as if the beam were actually a beam of light, right? So the source is that, well, it's a light bulb filament, so that's convenient. And imagine that the, the geometry of this will determine what the beam shape is. So it's going to be shining out through that slit like a cone. And the further away that filament is from the slit, the more narrow the cone will be, right? Because that's just the geometry of how this works. Um, we'd really like this thing to be perfectly aligned so that when we're shooting ions out of here, they, they come out perfectly aligned on the axis of the stopper. And it's rather difficult to get all this set up perfectly. So we put these other two electrodes in here. It's actually a brass plate, one on each side, and they're electrically isolated too. And the idea there is that we can apply a little bit of voltage to these brass plates to kind of steer the beam in a way that we want to, to happen, right? So if we're, if we're not perfect in aligning this filament exactly with the slit, and then our system is not going to work because the beam is actually shooting out sideways. We can apply a little bit of voltage here to fix things, to, to fix the field so that we get everything aligned perfectly. As it turned out, these steering electrodes were not that helpful, but we'll talk about um, the use of this a little bit later. Here's the detector side. So we've got same rubber washer, same slit on the receiver side, and then there is a copper cup also attached to a needle that goes through the stopper. And the cup goes to this SMA connector, which goes to the pre-amplifier board. So this is a uh, trans-impedance amplifier of gain of about a million. And uh, it's, a, it's actually a really nice chip, but I'm not using it to its fullest capability. Uh, this system is not high bandwidth, but it is very high gain. And the trick here is that the amplifier has to be really close to the source because the input capacitance is a big problem. And this was actually an oversight that I missed for longer than I should have. But uh, if you have input capacitance, that really ruins your whole trans-impedance amplifier. So you want this thing to be as close as possible and as little input capacitance as possible. And in this case, this whole thing is maybe on the order of, I don't know, 10 puff or something like that. And that, that's even that is getting to be kind of a problem, but we'll, we'll talk about the usage also a little bit later. The power supply for the preamplifier is just two 9-volt batteries, and conveniently, I've got some voltage regulators here, conveniently these batteries are nice because you get a bipolar supply and it's super low noise and it's isolated from everything. It's actually a, a really nice way to do a front end like this. And then the output from this million gain trans-impedance amplifier goes to this cable, and then over to the bench, and we'll talk about that next. This is the cable from the preamplifier going into this low-pass filter, and then we also apply another 40 dB of gain, so another times 100, so the total gain here is 100 million, and then the output from this filter goes into the scope. The scope is configured in XY mode, so the vertical component of the trace is coming from our detector and amplifier here, and the X position of the trace is coming from our control system. So I mentioned that uh, we were going to be shooting this beam of electrons through the system and we're going to be detecting it and showing the detection results here. But how do we actually spread this into a spectrum? Like I've been talking about using a prism and this and that, but um, we need some way of actually shifting the spectrum back and forth to see the different components. So one way we could do this is to use something like a CCD or like an image sensor, like in a in a typical light-based uh, spectrometer, you shine your white light in and you use a prism or a diffraction grating, and then you use like an image sensor to capture all the different wavelengths at one time. But that's very difficult to do here because the signal is just so darn small. We're going to be talking about sub-nanoamp signals and having an array detector that's able to, to amplify nanoamp signals from a huge sector of, of sensors is actually pretty difficult. So one way that we can fix this problem is to just have one detector and then rotate the prism back and forth. That would be kind of equivalent to 
uh, applying a changing magnetic field to move this path of ions back and forth. We basically sweep through different magnetic field strengths and stronger magnetic fields curve the particle beam more tightly than weaker magnetic fields. And this is a totally valid way to do it too. Uh, but the problem with that is um, we need a huge electromagnet and we need to control it very carefully. We might have problems with hysteresis and so on. So there's actually another trick. Uh, let's take a look at the schematic and we can see what we're going to do instead. Instead of changing the magnetic field strength, which would kind of be equivalent to rotating the prism in a light-based spectrometer, what we're going to do instead is change the incoming ion beam speed. We're basically going to be changing the acceleration voltage back and forth. And I know we're kind of pushing the analogy far here, but this is sort of equivalent to redshifting the entire beam of light that we're, go that we're sending into our prism. So if we were to redshift all of the light going into our prism by a known amount, that would indeed shift the output spectrum. And if we knew what that shift was, then we would be able to figure out you know, what we're doing. And in reality, this is pretty easy. Basically, we start off with a DC power supply set to a fixed value. That's kind of our, our, our you know, base acceleration voltage. And then we put an AC supply in series with it. So the AC voltage is just added on to the DC voltage. And this AC voltage represents um, our continuous red shifting that's going back and forth. And it's this AC signal that, that drives the X position on the oscilloscope. Here's a better look at the internals of the control circuit. Uh, the original schematic specified a potentiometer and a filament transformer, but instead I'm using this variac over here, and the variac powers this transformer, and then this transformer powers the filament. And uh, no real particular reason to do it, I just had these parts on hand. Um, the big meter over here describes how much current is going through the filament, and that's on the order of about three-tenths of an amp. And then the small meter, the microamp meter, is wired in series with the filament and the high voltage supply. It's kind of fun to have a current meter that's not connected physically to anything, right? Like the ions are jumping off the surface of this tungsten filament, and the meter will show that ion stream, like the actual current involved with that ion stream. And they're leaving the filament and going down the tube of the spectrometer. It's kind of fun to have a, a current meter that's just not really physically connected to anything. That, that is how it works. Um, one point that's different from the Scientific American article, they claim that the emission current should be about one microamp. I never got this thing to work with one microamp of ion emission. I needed at least five or ten to see a signal at the other end. Um, one theme that keeps coming up uh, in, in my testing is that they're really stretching how well this thing works in terms of the numbers. And so getting away with one microamp of emission current means that your signal is going to be probably less than a nanoamp. And it's really tough, or at all, and it's really tough to sort of extract that out. So to make your chances a little bit better, just give it an extra order of magnitude of, of transmit current. Another major problem of using this thing is that the amount of mass that goes in there is limited, right? Like we put this thing together, putting some fluid on the tungsten filament, waiting for it to dry, then assembling the whole machine, starting it up and trying to get a signal. And after the filament is hot for about five or 10 minutes, most of the usable mass has been boiled away. Either not, not all of it gets ionized. Actually, a lot of it just ends up spraying the inside of that ion gun chamber. But the point is that you only get five or ten minutes of use out of this thing before it uses up all of its sample. Then you have to wait for the whole system to cool down, bring it back up to room pressure, add more sample to it, put it all back together, vacuum it back down, only to get another five or ten minutes of, of time to get this thing working. So it's a very um, challenging and uh, sometimes exasperating system to get going. So that makes it even more satisfying when I finally got a signal out of it. So let's take a look at that. So finally, after months of poking at this thing, I got a signal. And the signal looks just like the one from the Scientific American article and the one from the Dudney paper. So it must be correct. Done. Upload to YouTube. But not so fast. This is where things actually get really interesting. Uh, I think there's a couple problems with this result, and since the result is the same in the original paper, the Scientific American article, and my own results, uh, I think there's a sort of a systematic problem in here that's interesting to look at. So first, let's unpack what this signal is showing us. There's two obvious peaks here, 
And allegedly what this is, is the two isotopes of potassium. So the element or the uh, compound that we're looking at is potassium chloride. That's what this, you know, no salt dietary salt substitute is. And potassium happens to have two common isotopes. So similar to carbon-14 dating, you know how that works. You, uh, you know, carbon normally has six protons and six neutrons, but sometimes it has an extra two neutrons, carbon-14. And that one happens to be radioactive. So over time, the carbon-14 uh, diminishes in uh, value just because it's radiating away these neutrons and becoming carbon-12. And if you measure the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, you can um, estimate the date of this thing. So essentially what we're doing with the potassium is potassium dating this substance. But in our case, the potassium, uh, the heavier variant of potassium that has these extra neutrons is stable. So you can't really date it using this technique. And in fact, all the potassium samples in the world will have this ratio because it's stable. It, it'll almost never change. So the two most common kinds of potassium are potassium-39 and potassium-41. And the ratio should be approximately 15 to 1. So the first problem with this graph is that the peak heights are not in the ratio of 15 to 1. Um, it's really, it, it's hard to see because the uh, grid lines aren't quite so visible in the Dudney paper, but it looks to me like it's less than 10 to 1 and kind of maybe closer to 6 to 1. So that's way off. And we might be able to explain that away by saying, well, you know, it's a nonlinearity in the amplifier, or maybe there was like mass fractioning going on where the thing boiled off the lighter variant first, and then there was more of the heavy one or this or that, or something, but I don't buy it. I think there's a big problem in there. But an even bigger, bigger problem than that is that the acceleration voltages are wrong. So they're correct for potassium in general, but the separation between the peaks is too high to be realistic. So let's dig quickly into the math and I'll show you why I think this is the case. So I mentioned that the accelerating voltage was overall correct for potassium, and here's what I mean by that. Since we're dealing with particle physics, we have a very simple formula that describes how a charged particle is going to move in a magnetic field. And here it is. So the radius of curvature is equal to one over the magnetic field times the square root of two times the mass of the particle times the electric field that the particle was accelerated in divided by the charge. And we can just plug in the numbers. We know the magnetic field because we can measure it directly. We know the radius because it's literally the curvature of the copper pipe. It's hard to change that. And we know what the fundamental charge is. We're going to make one assumption here is that all of the particles that this mass spectrometer produces have single charge, like one ionization, one missing electron. And uh, if we rearrange the formula to get the mass out, we end up with this. We can plug in the numbers. And all these numbers are constant, so we can just put them all together. And what we end up with is this constant divided by the accelerating voltage equals the mass in kilograms. So if we go back to the oscilloscope trace, the center voltage here is approximately 110 volts. But I've got a 10 to 1 voltage divider on the x-axis. So that top peak is about 1.6 volts above zero, but really that's 16 volts above. So a total of 126 volts. And if we plug in the numbers, 126 volts into the formula, we end up with this really tiny number in kilograms, and if we convert that to atomic mass units, we get 39. Perfect. That's exactly what potassium should be. Um, now, of course, I've, I've massaged the numbers a little bit, so this one comes out perfect, right? Like, the magnetic field strength varies a lot from the center to the edge, and you can kind of tweak it a little bit. And there, there was a little bit of tweaking going on, but that's not going to affect what I say next. Now, the other peak... The smaller peak is about 0.6 volts on the x-axis below the center voltage. That means 6 volts lower than 110 or 104. And if we use the same formula, we're not massaging the numbers between, same formula, 104 volts in, we end up with 47 atomic mass units. It's way off. That should be 41. If it were correct, it would be 41. So I kind of went back and forth and tried to find a problem in the system, or maybe I didn't measure something correctly, but I feel like um, with all the constants held, or with all the values, even the measured ones held, really the delta should be correct. Um, I can't see a reason why the center voltage would be correct and then the delta would be wrong. But here's the thing, if we go backwards and plug 41 atomic mass units into this to figure out what voltage it should be, 
it comes out to be about 120 volts, or about 6 volts down from 126, or 0.6 on this x-axis on the oscilloscope plot. And look at that. That's, notice how asymmetric this peak is, right? There it is, 0.6 down. That is actually the, uh, the isotope of potassium sitting there. And then it gets even better. If you look at the Dudney papers and the Scientific American papers, their peaks are really asymmetric too. So I am almost certain that the isotope is hiding in there. And the reason that we can't see it as a separate peak is because the machine just doesn't have the resolution to separate them, although it's close. So if that asymmetric peak is really both isotopes of potassium, what is that other peak that's sitting there? I don't know. I, I don't think it's real. Like, I don't think it's actually an isotope or, or a particle in the system that's being counted. I think it's a, an artifact of the measurement. And lending a little bit more uh, weight to this theory, look at the shape of the small peak and the shape of the big peak. They're almost the same in that they both have this kind of asymmetric thing going on, which I find highly suspicious. And in playing around with this thing for, you know, now it's been days or hours or whatever, I get the feeling that it's some kind of like a mirroring type thing. Like the system is producing a mirror of that large peak and that's why it's there. there. There's something that's basically reflecting the signal, whether it's in the electrical system, but I haven't figured out what it is. Some kind of weird hysteresis thing where when it's scanning forwards, it, it has an offset to, that, that it doesn't have when it's scanning backwards in voltage or something. I don't know, but you guys are pretty smart and I'd like to hear what you think in the comments. And uh, I think we're gonna be talking about spectrometers um, a little bit more next time. Uh, we're gonna get into a, a different kind of spectrometer that uses lasers. And I kind of hinted at that. And um, I hope you found this interesting and I will see you next time. Bye.